This is the Cyber Kumite. I'm Tim Wainwright, and this is Chris Salerno. Today, our guest is Matt McHugh, and we're talking about CASB versus DLP. Before we get started, today's Kumite is brought to you by our sponsor, Tools Shield, the mm -hmm. cyber insurance policy now available from all major carriers that actually reimburses your costs of switching tools when a software giant acquires and kills a great innovative tool you were using. That's Tools Shield. Would buy. Uh, so Matt, let's let's get right into this. Where are we at here? What's what's the state of these tools? I know we're trying to protect data. That's the overarching uh, control here. We've got DLP and we've got CASB. Um, what's the latest on them? Yeah. So from what I've seen and what I've heard, uh, as far as endpoint DLP technologies go. There really hasn't been a whole lot of changes over the last few years. Um, they're still very much agent based. Um, they give you very robust um, data pattern detection and DLP capabilities for just about any data loss vector associated with an endpoint. So things like printing, um, copying files to removable media, transferring files via FTP or to a network file share. Um, you know, uploading files via a web browser or sending them via an email client. So, um, you know, again, a lot of it's very much the same as it has been over the last mm -hmm. few years. Now, a lot of these endpoint DLP tools also have some sort of network DLP component as well, typically for additional money, um, as you would expect. Um, but we really don't see this implemented at organizations, you know, quite as frequently as an endpoint DLP solution. And I think there's really two reasons for this. The first is because there's so much encrypted traffic uh, on the network these days, you do have to decrypt the traffic in order to effectively scan the content for uh, DLP violations. So uh, you would need to perform SSL decryption. And while that's, you know, a lot of organizations are doing this, they're typically doing this with other tool sets like next generation firewalls, for example. Mm. Uh, and then they either don't want to do it twice on the network or they don't have the capability to chain the tools together. Uh, and get that inspection you know, from a device that's already doing that level of SSL decryption. So that's the first reason. And then the second reason I don't think it's as common is because you still get a lot of visibility and control into network traffic with your endpoint DLP agent as well. So as I said, you can get visibility into content uploaded to, uh, through a web browser uh, or content sent via email. So it's just not as necessary. So network, network uh, so Matt, network DLP is dead. Is that what you're saying? Endpoint DLP can cover a lot of the use cases. It's still out there if you have, you know, a robust solution for it, but no one's rolling out net new network DLP. What are they doing instead? So I, I, I really haven't seen it. Um, you know, I was just about to get into where CASB fits into all of this and CASB does have some network DLP capabilities as well. Um, but really the risk that CASBs were intended to uh, help mitigate were you know, as organizations started to shift to more and more software as a service applications, there's this new risk of users going in, accessing company data from these cloud applications, from systems that are not managed by the organization and from networks that are not managed by the organization. So there's this complete visibility gap because, you know, employees could, for instance, sign into Office 365 from their personal computers. Uh, and then once that data is on their personal computers, the organization now no longer has control yeah. uh, or visibility into that. So um, that's really what CASBs help to address. CASBs also can perform that level of network DLP as well, depending on the deployment architecture. Um, so to say it's completely dead wouldn't be fair to the CASB vendors that, that do do perform, uh, that do have the forward proxy capability. So Matt, how about, how about the difference between a standalone CASB and what an NGFW can do? Because you mentioned earlier that NGFW can do the SSL inspection. Um, is, that a, is that a viable alternative to a standalone CASB? Do they do more or less the same things? You know, what, what's, what's the, the use case overlap and difference there? So when it comes to next generation firewalls, you could theoretically achieve some of your use cases. Um, the advantage to it, I guess the big caveat to that is I have not seen a next generation firewall that has DLP capabilities anywhere remotely close to, you know, that of the, you know, stronger CASB vendors. Hmm. Um, so that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is 
typically your next generation firewalls just sit on your network. Uh, whereas CASBs that have this forward proxy capability, there's an agent that's sitting on all of your managed endpoints. It routes all of your cloud application traffic through a forward proxy that's typically hosted in the, um, you know, in the CASB vendor's cloud. And you get visibility into that traffic no matter whether they're on the network or working from their, their home network or a Starbucks or wherever. So um, that's really the one advantage. Yes, you could have some sort of always on VPN capability associated with your next generation firewall that's always sending that traffic back and doing that you know, DOP inspection. Uh, but I think the difference in DOP capabilities alone, you know, you really couldn't replace a, a, a CASB from that perspective with the next generation firewall. Yeah. Matt, what, what are we what are we talking about here? When someone wants to do either CASB or DLP, and maybe the use cases are different, but what, 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 give me like give me two really common use cases for these tool sets. So, when it comes to CASB, the use cases are so heavily driven by the deployment model. Mm. So we just talked about forward proxy, and as I was just saying, it typically involves an agent being deployed on your managed endpoints that's forwarding cloud application traffic through a proxy and performing some sort of policy level inspection, you know, often DLP focused policies mm -hmm. uh, from there. So with that deployment, you know, your typical use cases are you want to stop sensitive data from going to unmanaged cloud applications. So a great example is you don't want your users to upload, you know, your company's crown jewels to their personal Google drive. Mm -hmm. So that's one use case that, you know, your CASB forward proxy deployment will address. Um, but that being said, you can also, get, you know, address that with your endpoint DLP solution as well. So there is some overlap from that perspective. Gotcha. Um, the other two common deployment models for CASB are reverse proxies, which are essentially a gateway to one of your managed cloud application instances. So no matter where a user is, is accessing that application from, no matter what system their application or accessing that application from, they are going through that reverse proxy on the way to and from that application. So you can have visibility and control into uh, the data that's entering and leaving that, that cloud application. Um, so Matt, you, you mentioned an interesting uh, concept there. You, you know, you wouldn't want your end users, your employees to upload sensitive data to, to their Google cloud or their, you know, uh, Microsoft uh, instance but you would want them to upload it to the, the corporate Google Cloud and the, the corporate O365. How does CASB handle that? Because ultimately at a proxy level, you've got a whitelist google.com addresses and, and you know, docs.google.com looks exactly the same when you use it personally and when you use it for the enterprise. Yep, so, and this is where CASBs or at least the more robust CASBs can address a gap that does exist within other platforms. Yeah. Uh, and the very best CASBs have the ability to identify the specific application instance. Gotcha. Uh, and gotcha. with that, you can enforce very granular policies where you could say, you know, you're allowed to upload this sensitive data pattern to our organization's Office 365 instance, but block um, that data pattern from being uploaded to any other Office 365 mm -hmm. instance. Or you could just, you know, more black and white say, allow access to our instance block access to all other instances. So you do get that instance level visibility with the uh, more robust CASB solutions. Matt, that's a great, great example of something that's working well. And one of the things that I find really insightful when, when I talk to somebody like you who spent a lot of time hands-on with these technologies is, tell me where it breaks. You know, t tell, tell me about the broken promises uh, from, from the sales teams, the things they said that it's going to make all your all your data protection dreams come true, but try as you may, and, and you know, networking with with your peers and other places too. You've just found you know what that this this doesn't work as well as it should. What what are the thing? What are the use cases that fall down for CASB? Um, yep. So as far as the use cases that fall down, I don't know that there's really any broken promises, but from what I've seen, the one you're, that was true believer. The one that was most overhyped would be the shadow IT visibility use case. Uh, this was big a couple years back where CASB vendors would say, we'll tell you what, you know, IT or cloud platforms that your users are using that your business is not sanctioning so that you can help make informed decisions and prioritize investments into software as a service applications that will meet their needs. Mm -hmm. uh, and really what 
you, you ended up seeing in these shadow IT reports were A, these users are accessing their personal cloud applications and there's nothing in the corporate acceptable use policy to prevent them from doing that. And then B, you know, so many organizations are working with partners. Um, we're a great example. We work with clients all the time. And in some cases we're using our IT platforms for collaboration. Other times we're using them or theirs. And it's the same for other organizations as well. So even though let's say Dropbox wasn't, um, wasn't a managed application for an organization, that doesn't mean they don't have a business partner that requires certain individuals from the company to use Dropbox to share files. So it, basically it ended up being a big report that said, here's a list of all of the unmanaged cloud application usage in your environment and nobody did anything with it. Hmm. So same, same question, endpoint DLP, to the extent that you're kind of still spending time with it, with that type of solution, um, you know, what, what, are, what, are the, what are the major limitations of using endpoint DLP as one of the cornerstones of your data protection program? I think the easy answer is scope. So you only have visibility into the devices that have the endpoint DLP agent on it. So there's so many other devices that uh, on your network that don't support it. Um, or the example that, that I gave earlier around people accessing cloud applications from personal devices, there's just no way to, to put an endpoint DLP on their personal uh, agent on their personal devices. Okay. So uh, I think that's the biggest gap um, as far as the, the systems that have it, you know, there's some pretty robust capabilities there for sure. You know, Matt, one of the one of the problems that uh, I always ran into when working with DLP solutions, and I'm curious to see if this is the same with CASB, uh, was the sheer volume of false positive. There, there was just so many false positives that fired in any one of these solutions, and I don't really care what uh, what what vendor it was, and it uh, and it fell on on the SOC or the team reviewing those uh, to just continuously have to mark these false positives. There didn't seem to be a great way to tune. You could do some tuning, of course, but uh, we ended up the, the same way. Did CASB help with that at all, or are we we still there? There's probably two reasons for experiencing a large volume of, of false positives. One, either the actual DLP capabilities of the platform, you know, is not very robust. Mm -hmm. You know, we've seen some, uh, you know, more primitive CASB solutions that just had a regex text box that said, you know, here, here's your, your DLP pattern that you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, whereas others had more robust capabilities like exact match and weighted dictionaries and so forth. So um, that could be part of it is a limitation on the specific vendor. Yeah. And then the second piece to that is there might not be a, a true data protection program in place, uh, which your DLP tools are looking to enforce. So really before you can even throw a, a DLP tool or a CASB uh, at this problem, you need to first understand as an organization, what is the sensitive data that we have in our, our environment? Um, you know, what are the re regulations that we have to comply with? Where does that, where is that data stored? How is it processed? Who should have access to it? Who should not have access to it? And then only, only then once you understand all of that, can you actually implement controls uh, around that program. And, and that could be a piece of it too, where you know, people were interacting with that data, but it was just part of their day-to-day -day function. Um, and it, the, the DLP tool was correctly flagging it. It's just- Matt, it was um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cut you off there. That sounds like a lot of work. Can't we just buy a tool and make this go away? <laughs> like like in the history of cybersecurity, that's ever been an option. I appreciate you bringing it back to the data protection program. You know, what's our scope? What are we trying to do? What are our priority use cases? Is CASB even going to address the thing that the organization cares about the most? Uh, and I, th I think that's the right approach. So let me ask you this, because I know you've done a little work in this space too. What's the role of CASB in an insider risk program? Uh, it's, it's just an extension of your of your DLP capability. Um, so preventing sensitive data from, you know, leaving the organization from, you know, either accidentally just from yeah. someone inside who has access to it, they type in the wrong email address um, and send it to the wrong recipient, or someone intentionally trying to steal that data. So CASB is is no different than an endpoint DLP solution. It just gives you different capabilities and a little bit different coverage. So th that, that's where I was hoping you would go because I know we've talked about insider risk programs before in terms of intentional and accidental use cases. And you mentioned both there for both the endpoint DLP and CASB as potential solutions. Now, accidental, I think the conventional wisdom is that 
these tools are designed to be able to catch accidental, uh, inadvertent data, dis you know, that w would be data disclosures. But are you saying too that you think that they at this point are robust enough that they help to address some of the use cases of kind of motivated insiders that are trying to exfil data? Now, in this case, not you know, not a not an advanced threat actor that's gotten into the environment, but rather an insider who you know is an employee or a contractor, a visitor, employee contractor who's actually trying to you know make a uh, you know monetize some data they have access to before they quit the organization or something like that. Do you think it's robust enough for that? The way I'd put it is they detect what they can detect regardless of what the motivation was. So if someone really wanted to bypass either of these controls, the reality is they probably can. Um, you know, as far as CASB goes, one of the biggest blind spots to it you know, is encrypted zip files, right? It can, encrypt, it can decrypt the traffic, but it can't decrypt an encrypted file. So if you zip something up in an encrypted file and then you know, send it out over the internet or upload it to a personal cloud application, your CASB is not going to flag that. Now, you're, this is where your endpoint DLP solution can come in and, and possibly detect that depending on how it's configured. Um, but there's typically always going to be a way around um, a DLP deployment, unfortunately. So do you think combining the two in an organization with enough resources, combining robust endpoint DLP and robust CASB really does narrow those blind spots and opportunities for motivated insiders to get around it. It narrows it, but it'll never eliminate the risk. Okay, so 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 give, so I'm a, I'm an insider and I'm trying to steal data, and tell me tell me how to do it. Tell, tell me how to get the data out of Fort Knox. One of the examples that has come up recently with uh, with an organization, and we were talking in the context of insider threat, and, and this is a lot more prevalent than just this organization is developers stealing source code and. You know, maybe stealing is not the right word, but they developed it technically it's owned by the organization. And as they, you know, a lot of them are, are contractors as they move from one contract to another, they like to bring that code with them. It is incredibly difficult to, you know, write a DOP rule to detect source code. Hmm. So that's one example where regardless of what technologies you have, it's just going to be incredibly difficult to stop unless you, you know, cut off the, cut off the data loss vectors, you know, prevent them from being able to use USB, uh, prevent them from being able to access personal GitHub accounts. Um, so that's just one example of, you know, it's probably fairly easy to exfiltrate that data, um, but there are ways that you could, you know, cut off some of those data loss vectors. It isn't, you know, for, for that type of control, are, aren't we trying to keep the controls a little closer to the source in that case with kind of check in, check out, um, especially for, you know, production source code. I, you know, it seems to me that those types of controls would be a fallback for for preventing that type of data loss, and and, and appropriately so, because it sounds like as you're saying they're not, uh, they have a difficulty discerning that type of content. Yeah, it's just a tough problem to solve. Yeah, you, you can always copy that code. You're looking at it in a, in a console as a, as a dev, regardless of the, the the location of it. Copy and pasting that out is, is relatively straightforward. You know, I, I really do think these are tools geared towards identifying the accidental and curious use cases, not, not the advanced actors and not, not even, even an advanced insider. To me, it's too easy to get past that with a variety of, of, of different methods that are, that are just designed to confuse tools like this and, and move past it. Um, it's, it's a better control, both CASB and DLP, and mainly CASB now is so much as in the cloud, to say that we have a control that's supposed to stop um, accidental uh, data data leaking from from our network, and that way you're you're covered from that standpoint. And I think that's a little bit of what the auditors want to hear, um, and and it's why uh, why some of these tools get implemented to begin with, um, and and they need they need to be configured a little bit better uh, than than what I've seen out there. Um, Matt, you know, one of the things that is, is curious about these and kind of going down that route is, you know, if it's not the LP and it's not CASB, uh, if you just needed to kind of focus on protecting that really sensitive information, would you start with one of those tools or would you start somewhere else? Yep. So as I was saying uh, a little bit ago, I'd start with the program, uh, okay. understanding what that data is, you know, who should access it um, or who should access it, how is it um, transferred and so forth, um, and then build controls around that, you know, for those specific use cases. 
you're not going to be able to just throw either a CASB or a DLP tool in and, and hope it works. Um, it's just not going to. So start with the program and then design, you know, each individual uh, control around the use case. Is there any learning aspect to these tools now? So, you know, I hear you saying, hey, we need this program, but can it go out and, and, and look at your, your SharePoint, your, your giant data repositories and say, okay, I can understand that there's sensitive data in these locations. If, can, it, can it do that scanning and learning? Yep. A lot of, uh, you know, even CASB, uh, CASB tools can go do, go do that in your managed cloud applications. Um, but again, they are reliant on the data patterns that you create or they're out of the box data patterns. So um, you still have to write the data patterns, the same one that you would use uh, to you know, identify sensitive data in line and stop it from being uploaded to the cloud in the first place. So again, it, it's going to be as limited as those, those um, DLP capabilities. Yeah. Well, Tim, Matt. Yeah, Matt, thanks a lot. This, this has been fantastic. I think uh, we're out of time for today. Appreciate being able to pick your brain. Uh, in this area. Um, for everyone listening, our guest has been Matt McHugh. I'm Tim Wainwright, reminding you that I taught Chris Salerno everything that he knows. And I'm Chris Salerno, and that's news to me.